Well, so great to have the children with us in the service. And uh, I was thinking back to my days when I was growing up in church, and we would go up and do those things. And so, like uh, John said, we're trying to be, um, you know, a family like that. And uh, it's such a joy, really, to be able to see these kids uh, growing up like this. And as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about my own children. You know, we have videos of them, and it was done on a camcorder. It's not easy as easily accept, accessible as you guys can do it on your iPhones and things, but um, we love to look at those old videos of them and uh, seeing them uh, singing songs and doing uh, these uh, poems and different things during the Christmas season. Now, uh, as I was thinking about this message, I wanted to share with you a story that is one of my all-time favorite stories of our family. And uh, I, Susan says that I've shared it with you all before. I don't remember ever saying it. She's heard it so many times. Uh, but I, I wanted to share with you as we have this uh, opportunity here as we're getting into this family season. One of the things that we did in our family uh, growing up uh, with my children is every night they would get a pretend story. So I would sit them down and I would tell them a pretend story. They could pick any character they wanted and I would take those characters through some adventure and at the end of the day, my boys and these characters, they would save the day. So just like this, every, uh, every night I would do this. And so that's how I told these young preachers is how you can learn how to capture the attention of adults. If you can get kids to listen to you for 10 minutes, I was like, you can get the adults to listen to you for 15 you know, so um, as we uh, did that every night, I loved doing that. It was such a fun time every night that we would do this. And so one night, uh, friends of ours were over visiting, and they wanted uh, me and Susan to just talk to them about some things going on in their life. They had some difficulty in the workplace, and so he wanted to tell me about his boss and some of the things he was doing. So my friend, Rohan, uh, when he was there, right after dinner, I said, you know, Rohan, I said, will you do me a favor this week? You know, every day I tell a pretend story to the kids. Would you give me one week, one day of a break, and I want you to tell the pretend story today. And he said, well, what do I do? So ask for some characters, take the characters who's a magical adventure, and at the end of the day, they save the day and live happily ever after. He said, okay, great, I'll do that. So he says, what do you want to Nathan? Nathan says, I want an elephant. He's four years old, okay, I want an elephant. Josiah, what do you want? Josiah says, I want a monkey, all right? So uh, Rohan, he starts to talk, and as he's sharing the story, he uh, takes uh, this monkey and this elephant through an adventure. Now, remember, he was having difficulty at work. The elephant was this employee, and the monkey was the bad boss. You know, and so he takes these characters through this thing. My kids are totally listening. They're laughing. They're looking at each other. They're having a great time. I mean, it is like a party in that room. He's doing it the right way. Gets to the end of the story, and he says, they lived happily ever after, the end. As soon as he says that, Nathan, four years old, he starts to cry uncontrollably. He is bawling. Tears are coming down his face. He, he can't breathe. You know, we're like, where's the albuterol? We need to give him, a, you know, something. He's like, asthma attack him on. He cannot control it. He is so distraught. I'm like, Nathan, what's going on? Just calm down, calm down, calm down. I bring him over my lap. I was like, Nathan, calm down. What's the matter? Tell me what's the matter. And he can't even voice it. I was like playing the whole thing in my head, the story. And I said, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan. He didn't say once upon a time, right? He didn't say once upon a time. So I said, all right, all right listen, calm down. It's okay, Nate. It's okay. Rohan, tell the whole story again. <laughs> it's like, this is his first time telling a pretend story. He's like, the whole thing? I said, the whole thing. Start to finish. Same characters, the whole thing. Once upon a time, happily ever after. I said, I'm sorry. I set you up for failure. I didn't tell you that that's how it's supposed to be. And so he does the whole thing again. Nathan at the end of it jumps off my lap, hugs everybody, goes off to bed, skipping and happy. Nathan experienced what all of us experience almost every day of our lives. When things aren't the way they're supposed to be, it sets us off on a course where we have no peace. Today's Advent theme is peace. Our word is peace. The kids read a passage about peace. And I want you to experience peace during this Christmas season. Now, in our English language, the word that we translate from the Bible as peace is really hard for us because in English, peace really means the absence of conflict. We want to see peace in the Middle East, right? We want to see peace uh, between people. It's like this idea where we're not going to be against one another. This is the idea that we have when we think about peace. But in the Bible, peace is translated from the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom is much more than just the absence of conflict. It's peace, prosperity, welfare, wholeness, 
holiness, transformation. Cornelius Plantinga, he uh, wrote about this in a book, and this is what he says. It's a universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed, all under the arch of God's love. Shalom, in other words, is the way things are supposed to be. So when the Bible talks about peace, the Bible speaks about shalom, it's more than just an absence of conflict. It's getting back to the way things were supposed to be when the world was created. And like Nathan, who cried because the pretend story wasn't the way it's supposed to be, all of us here as we journey on this earth, we too are faced with things. Someone gets cancer, and you say, this doesn't feel like the way it's supposed to be. A marriage, is, a marriage is on the rocks, and you're like, this just doesn't feel like it's the way it's supposed to be. And so we have that in our heart, and we understand it, and I'm trying to give you a category for it. It is because it is not shalom. It is not peace. And so we are going to spend some time now in the Word of God thinking about the Prince of Peace, who on that day that we're remembering right now, he came to earth. And he gave us what we needed, shalom. You can turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 8. We're considering the truth of our message today. The peace of God changes everything. The peace of God changes everything. Father, there are some here today who are really in need of your peace, of your shalom. And I ask God that you would do that. Grant it to them, Lord. And we thank you that your word speaks to these things and helps us. And so we're asking for your help today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. First, let's consider from our text about the peace of God and how it can change us. The peace of God overcomes my fear of the unknown. The peace of God overcomes my fear of the unknown. Starting at verse 8, Luke chapter 2. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. So the same region, this is referring to verses 1 through 7, where Jesus is born to Mary and Joseph, and he's born there in the city of David, and so that's Bethlehem, and so these shepherds are in that same region. They're not in Bethlehem, but they're in that same region. They're in the area. They're close by, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear, fear of the unknown. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. The peace of God overcomes my fear of the unknown. The shepherds in those days, they were rough people. And if you've been to church, maybe you've heard pastors, you know, talk about this idea. It's something that I read this week and just studied about shepherds. And in those days, they were untrustworthy people in general. But at night, you needed some people to watch the flocks because the trustworthy people didn't want those jobs. And so the shepherds in those days, they were out there in the fields. They would have smelled like the sheep. They would have been rough people. And so these shepherds were there and We can speculate why God would make it known about Jesus to these rough shepherds. And so maybe it's because Jesus is called the good shepherd. It could be that. It could be because Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so, again, this shepherd illustration. But I think it's very important to note that he didn't come to the priests or the religious leaders. He didn't come to the kings He came, didn't even come to all of people maybe like us who have nice warm houses where uh, we're able to be in comfort at night. He came to those that were outside, to the rough ones, and he spoke this word. And so at first, there's a lot of fear, but it turns to peace. In one of R.C. Sproul's books, he describes a lecture that he heard uh, called God's Love Affair with Shepherds. And in this lecture, he describes it how uh, the lecturer had gone through the whole Bible and talked about this theme of shepherds in the redemption story. R.C. Sproul writes this, when God appeared in the burning bush to call a leader to bring forth the exodus, 
he chose a man living in exile in the Midianite desert who was tending sheep. His name was Moses. When Israel became a nation, there came a time when a shepherd boy, David, was anointed king. Even if we go to the age of the prophets, we find Amos, not a man of great stature, but a shepherd whom God called into service for himself. Many prominent people in biblical history were called by God from the realm of the culturally insignificant to be his servants. It was to such people that God sent the angel to announce the birth of Messiah. And that's the way that God is, going to the ordinary, going to the everyday, coming to people who, like us, have difficulties and not everything is perfect, to people that are rough. And so he comes and he shares this. Now, verse 9 continues, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So one lone angel comes, and the glory of the Lord is shining all around them. So this is a spectacle. It's something they've never seen before, this lighting up that's happening. And so they aren't just uh, thinking about the unexpected. They're terrified by the unknown. What is this that's here? We have no idea. We've never seen this before. And now in front of us, we're seeing this thing that is causing me great fear. It was terrifying. Verse 10, the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. When angels appear, sometimes they got to say that, fear not. And it would be the same for us today if an angel were to show up because it would be terrifying. And so we hear the angel saying to them, fear not for the thing that's unknown. He says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The angel comes with this message, good news. It's the gospel. There's good news of great joy that's going to be for all the people. There's going to be a shalom carrier, a shalom giver, and he's been born, and he is here, and he says where he is. A Savior who is Christ the Lord is in the city of David. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Three names, three titles there, Savior, Christ, Lord. A Savior, a Savior is someone who rescues, comes in and takes someone who is in need of rescue and saves them. A Savior, if a building was on fire and a fireman went in, they would be called a savior. They saved them from peril. And so a savior, a rescuer, a savior who is Christ, that means the anointed one, the chosen one. This is Jesus we're talking about here. He's a rescuer. He's an anointed one. He's chosen. He's picked for a specific role. And then he is Lord. He's God. So the rescuer, the chosen rescuer is God, and he is in the city of David. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. A manger. A place where animals would feed. The anointed one. God incarnate is placed in a dirty manger. Some of you won't bring your children here to church until you, they have their shots. And here's Mary and Joseph having to place their child in a place where animals feed. Now we can sterilize this sometimes because of the pictures and images that we see from time to time. And I was looking at some children's Bibles that we used to use with our kids growing up. The first picture here you're going to see is Mary and Joseph and some animals. And there's the manger and the baby is in there. And I went to another Bible and I took another picture of that same scene. And there's Mary and Joseph and there's the manger and there's the baby, right? And so we have this image, and it's sort of sterile because you can't smell what would have been smelt in that area where the manger would have been. But here's what a manger really looks like. There'd be animals gathered. You put all the hay and the things in there, and that's where they would have gathered and fed. And Mary and Joseph looked around in this stable or cave. We don't know exactly where the baby was born, stable, cave, someplace, but there was a place where animals would have been. And in this area, the best option was not the floor. The best option to lay the child was in a manger, a place where animals eat. And as the shepherds were confronted with this terrifying scene, this thought of 
what they were going to see, the peace of God starts to come over them. What are you fearful of this season? What is it that is unknown ahead of you that is causing you a little bit of frustration or uncertainty and it can lead you to places where you actually fear the future? People have been asking me what I've been feeling about being, you know, an independent church as we're moving towards that, you know. I feel like God has just given us grace at different seasons. All of us would attest to that. And when we were launching, I needed a a certain grace in my life for being able to uh, preach through a sermon series. I'd never done that before where it was uh, me studying and working on what was going to be and what we were going to do and creating a calendar, preaching week after week in the prep, and I needed a grace. I had a little bit of fear. What's it going to be like? Will I be able to do this and maintain this level here of study and care and all this? And so it was a grace I needed, and I had fear, and I didn't know what it was going to be like. And then now as we're approaching the new year, there's some things sometimes I wake up because now all of a sudden for years I didn't have to worry about the finances. It was taken care of centrally, and now all of a sudden here we're we're thinking about our budget. You know, I walk by Pastor Ken's office, and what are you doing? He's like, I'm working on the budget, you know, and so, all right, well, how are we going to meet all of our needs next year, you know, as we're starting to think about the future? And so sometimes I have a fear because it's unknown of what it's going to really be like. And so as we face those fears, we're looking to God's Word for some understanding about how to overcome it. And so as we focus on Christ as our peace, He can give you uh, peace over the fear of the unknown. We're going to see more of that next. Notice this about the peace of God. The peace of God comes to me when God's glory is magnified. It comes to me when God's glory is magnified. Verse 13 says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So now the one angel is joined by a multitude of angels. The one angel and whatever glory was shining there, now a multitude, and I picture it just filling the sky. We can't even count it. It's not like they said 10 angels. They just said a multitude. It's a massive amount of angels filling the sky. And just imagine what these shepherds would have seen and felt here as they start to hear them say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. You see the order? Before we get peace on earth, It's glory to God in the highest. God gets the glory first. People want peace, and they want to figure out how to get peace, and what's the starting point of it, and they dance around the fact that it starts with God getting glory, God being made famous, God being exalted and elevated to the place of his rightful authority in our life, and so glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. It starts with God's glory, and then it comes to us. And on this night, in this stable or cave, in this manger, the baby, Jesus, the shalom bringer, God's glory manifested here on earth comes. And with him comes peace. He is the Prince of Peace. When you set your attention on Jesus Christ, when you keep your eyes focused on God's glory, it changes your perspective. All you can focus on is God's glory and the peace follows. You see? God's glory. And then, man, all I can do is be peaceful because my eyes are fixed on the right things. We used to live over here in Jefferson Park, and uh, in our neighborhood, we had some sidewalks, but sometimes we'd go for bike rides, and as we'd go for bike rides, we'd cross the street, Cicero, and end up over in uh, some of these other neighbors that didn't have sidewalks. So we'd go on bike rides. My oldest son was probably nine, Nathan seven, then Alicia was like three or four, and she'd be in the little trailer, and we'd go for these bike rides. And as we'd go, I'd always tell my boys, I said, don't go on up ahead. You've got to stay behind me because you don't know what's in front. And, you know, you'd be really careful. And there could be cars coming out and things. Just be very careful. And so we'd cross this road, get over this neighborhood, and then just I would take off, you know, to be in front. I think it was really funny. Nine years old, riding his bike. And then, you know, I'd be like, call him back. No, don't do this. Don't be very careful. You know, and there he's riding his bike. And he's looking back at us, riding his bike, and bam, right into a car. Hits this car, not a moving car, a parked car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. I just realized I never said that in any other services. A parked car. <laughs> and he ran into this parked car and um, he fell off his bike and we stopped and came over to him and the car looked and made sure his rubber tire hit it and everything was okay with the car. Uh, but he was scraped up a little bit. We picked him up and put him on 
uh, the vehicle. See, because he was looking backwards like this. So we keep God's glory, we keep the direction, we keep where we're going front and center in front of us, and peace follows. It's easy to follow God's glory in front of us, and then we follow. When our eyes are distracted from things in front of us, we can lose our bearings, and we crash and burn. If you keep your eyes on God, on God's glory, the peace follows. The Prince of Peace, the Giver of Peace. The shalom bringer, Jesus Christ, born that day, wants to give it to you. As we think about this, I want to share even for my own life some things that I think about. As I'm working on these messages, I think about my life and how I've worked through some things. And so I have four thoughts here. Unsatisfying sources of peace. These are all things that I've tried to get peace from in the past. First is other people other people. This is especially true of me when I was a kid, uh, junior high and high school, trying to get approval of all the people. And so this is a yearbook of my son at uh, Glenbrook South. And so, you know, you got to get people to sign your yearbook and, you know, um, you know, who's, it's big, I know, he goes to a very big school. And so you get people to sign the books. And that when I was a kid, man, junior high and high school, like, oh, I hope they'll sign it. And, you know, you're getting all those things and, you know, have a great summer, hope we'll be friends forever. You know, it's like, yeah, great. You know, and so this is what we're doing, right? Because we want some peace in relationships. Now, I want peace in relationships also, but sometimes we let a broken relationship with a person take us off of peace that God wants us to have. And so we work, we do what we can to make peace, but if it doesn't come, are you going to be unsatisfied in your life? Because it's not promised that you'll ever reconcile with whoever it is that's causing you the strain. But God wants to be the source of your peace even if that remains unreconciled. And so we work, we try, we pray, we're open, we're forgiving, we're ready. But if it doesn't ever come to be, my peace isn't lying in you. My peace lies in God. And that's an unsatisfying source of peace. I love people and I love to be loved by people. And God's given us an opportunity, our staff and leaders here, to be able to love all of you. And so I want peace, and I want that. But it cannot be my sole source. Because if it is, I'll be unsatisfied in the end. Other people. Next, the next achievement. The next achievement. And so we uh, want the next achievement, right? And so we want that trophy. We have a Christmas party coming up, and we want to be recognized. And I hope that I get that, you know, top salesperson or... You know, employee of the month or employee of the year and the next achievement. I, I want that promotion. I, I just want that next thing. And, man, you know what? I'll be better at home, honey, as soon as I get that job because this is the thing that I need. And when I get that, I'm going to have peace, the next achievement. And some of you have studied and worked so hard. And I, I'm so thankful that you're out there working and uh, doing your best for God's glory and your uh, working and making achievements and moving up in your fields and all that is great. I'm pretty driven too. But if my peace is going to be tied to the next achievement, I will never be satisfied because if I get it this year, then next year if I don't get it, where's my peace? Man, somebody else got the award next year. Then my peace, I'll be unsatisfied. And so it can be unsatisfying. Another uh, thought here is another dollar. Another dollar, right? And so if I just had another dollar, if I just had another dollar in my pocket, my bank account, man, a little bit of cushion, that'll help me, and I'll have peace. Trust me, honey, if I just, I'll just, it'll be okay, you know, if I just get that peace, it'll come to me. But usually what happens when we get that extra dollar, it's like the dollar came in, and then the dollar goes out. And then we pay for something else, and now, where's the dollar? The peace isn't gone. We bought something we thought would bring us peace. That thing doesn't even bring us peace. It's unsatisfying in the end, another dollar. And finally, ignoring pain, ignoring pain. Sometimes we'd rather have the absence of the conflict. We just want to ignore it, and we think that that's going to give us the peace that we so desperately need, but it leaves us wanting. We ignore the pain. I uh, have a, had a rotator cuff injury uh, many years ago, three or four years ago, and so when I first got the injury, I was, um, you know, trying to figure out what to do to make it better. And so first thing is like, you know, heating pad or ice or whatever. You're just like trying to just, t- just take care of it. And Susan's like, go to the doctor. I was like, no, I'm not going to go to the doctor. 
you know, just like take care of it like this. And so you come to church, and some you you know you want to somebody wants to get a hug. Like, Man, your hug was kind of weak. What's the matter there? Oh, my arm. Well, you should go see a doctor. Like, what do you know? You know, it's okay. I'll just go home, put a little bit of this on it. You know. And so then I call my trainer friends. I say, all right, my shoulder hurts a little bit. They're like, have you been to the doctor? No. Give me some stuff I can do at home. You know. So listen, I don't want to go to the doctor. I just want to work on this. All right, here, try this, try this, try this. Nothing works. So finally, like, I can't move my arm. And so I go to the doctor. They do a, an x-ray. And I have a strain, almost a tear. And so they say, you really need physical therapy. And so I went to physical therapy. I had to go through two rounds of physical therapy. And now I've got some range of motion. But if I didn't go to the doctor who was able to look deep and see what it was and not just try to address things on the superficial level, I would have never gotten to the end of it, and I would be um, preaching like this, right? Because I, I would not be able to move my arm today if I hadn't gotten to the root, to the deepness. And so you can't ignore it. You got to push through sometimes. You got to get through the difficult conversation. You got to get through the difficult relationship. You got to get through the difficult season. And as you do that, with the help of the peace satisfier, Jesus Christ, you can overcome, ignoring the pain. The only real source of peace in our lives is the peace that God gives. It is shalom, it's wholeness, the, sh the settled assurance that in our lives everything is going to be okay. You know, this uh, last night we had a staff party, and so I was preparing the message, and I was working, it was a busy week, and so I was working on the message really up towards the end of the day yesterday. And as I was preparing it, I was at home uh, working on this, and uh, Susan was getting the house ready for our staff party, and so she's starting to cook, and we were working on some games that we were going to play, and as we were getting all that prepared, I knew if I left, she was going to be stuck with all of it, and then I didn't know if I would come home to Shalom or not, you know? So uh, she was great. She was like joyfully cooking, ch chopping things up. You know, she's like doing her thing. And I was like, I, I got to help her. I got to help her with these games. So I started to work on some things and my frustration level is just rising and rising. I was like, I'm not going to have enough time. I won't have enough time to finish my notes. I won't have enough time. It's starting to build. It's building. It's building. And I'm preaching on peace. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, she, she moves something on my desk and my light goes off. And, oh, like it's just rising up. And I didn't say anything. I just... I thought, I'm speaking to our church family on shalom. Just give me peace, God. I can't control it. I'll be as prepared as I'm going to be prepared, and this is all that I can do. And I didn't blow it. But I'm not always like that. Sometimes I blow it. And I think because it was that time, because it was so close to me preparing and preaching that God had that in my heart. And so you all may be conquering some of these things. I hope that that can be your story and that you can remember and now have a category where the craziness is not the way things were supposed to be, but it's supposed to be this peace and shalom, and this can be what you draw your attention back to. And you know when that peace comes over you. You know when you've just said, oh, thank you, God, and it comes over you, and you feel that settled assurance in your heart. Philippians 4 Verses 6 to 7, it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So when your life is out of balance, when you're feeling the anxiety rush upon you, stop, ask, and pray the God of peace, who can do something about it. So let the God of peace, and let this peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Surpassing all understanding. What does that mean, surpassing all understanding? Come on up here, Patrick and Lisa. Come on up here. Patrick is on staff here, and uh, this is his fiance as of yesterday, Lisa. <laughs> Where's that ring? You got some? Oh, man, there we go. All right, proof. I saw pictures already, but uh, Patrick and Lisa were very thankful for the two of you. And so um, we're going to uh, just try to figure out this passage here a little bit about understanding. Um, so uh, both of you are, you, did you both graduate from Moody? One semester left at Moody, okay. And you, you started a master's program there yet? Okay, so 
in a master's program, and uh, you're almost finished, so two college uh, students here, and um, we're going to do some math, okay? So we're going to see who's better at math. And so whoever is better at math is going to be responsible for tutoring uh, the kids, God willing, one day when uh, you have it. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to start with you. Okay, so here, I'm going to put these in your hands. You're going to tell me how many oranges you have in a moment, okay? So you're going to have to do some math. You know how many you have in your hand right now? Okay, you're going to have to let go of his hand. Okay, there you go. They're newly, you know, fiancés. Here we go. Okay. And so now I'm going to put these other ones in your hand, and you're going to need to tell me how many you have. So how many do you have in that hand? Okay, and now I'm giving you. And how many do you have? Right, how did you figure that out? Math. Two plus two equals four. You're really good at that. Okay, two plus two equals four. Okay, so so far you're doing well. All right, Patrick, now for you. Ready for math? We'll see who's better at math. Okay, now Patrick, um, she answered that in like three seconds. So your question is coming up on the screen. You have three seconds. Okay, never mind. It's fine. You can turn that off. You can turn that off. Listen, that surpasses all understanding. You're like, I have no idea what that is. I got no idea. Exactly. You have no idea what it is. It surpasses all understanding. Like, I could sit here forever to try to figure this out. Like, well, I saw an F and I saw parentheses, but I don't even know what those signals are. It's just surpassing my understanding. And so you'll have no idea what to do, how to do that forever. He's in pastoral ministry. It's like, this is math. Some of you may be able to figure that out, but it's going to take a little time surpasses our understanding. It's beyond my comprehension. If I start to try to figure it out, my mind is going to be blown. I'm going to get a headache. It's beyond my understanding. The peace of God, it surpasses all understanding. So you try to explain to somebody, man, I got this peace in my heart. Let me just share with you. And they're like, I don't understand how you could have peace when someone so close to you passed. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to explain. As a matter of fact, it surpasses all understanding. I can barely understand it myself. And so uh, stay up here and just help me with this right now. So the idea here is there's the peace of God that per- surpasses all understanding. And so in your mind, okay, and then we've got here, you can put this around your neck there, heart. And I'm going to be the peace of God. All right, so the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, you can't fathom it, you don't understand it, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. It's like, get back, man, you can't, you know, just guarding your hearts and your minds. So your mind is like, man, why did he look at me with that stink eye? Man, why is he always like that? And your mind starts to go and like, what's up? Did I do something wrong? Like, what's going on? And man, I wish that I were, and your mind starts to go there. The peace of God will guard. It's guarding. It's protecting. It's got to be front and center. It's got to be what we're glorifying God, and the peace comes to us. We're magnifying it. And so the peace of God is going to guard your mind, but also guard your hearts. And in your heart, you're like, gosh, I'm so sad right now. And uh, uh, this really hurts what I'm feeling. And the peace of God wants to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you guys very much. Um, You can do whatever you want with those. We're done. So (laughs) uh, we're grateful, grateful for you guys. And um, after the service, they'll be up here at the front. You can come look at her ring if you'd like. (laughs) The peace of God, it surpasses all understanding. And it's going to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We sang about Jesus Christ as the King of Kings today. He's the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And he is the Prince of of peace, the place where Jesus reigns is over a domain called peace. The king of England at one point reigned as an absolute monarch over England. Today, Prince Albert reigns as an absolute monarch over Monaco. If he wants to do something, he does it. Doesn't need to check with anybody. I willed it, and so let it happen. And so he's a kind monarch, because in these days people revolt against monarchs that aren't, and they start to see that I need to be a little bit kinder with things. And so just like Prince Albert can do what he wants to do, just like the old king of England can do what he wants to do, Jesus Christ can do what he wants to do with the peace that he reigns over. And he's like, I want to give you peace. I want this for you. Here's peace for you. I reign over this. It's peace for you. What do you need? You need a here, 
I got peace for you. I'm the prince of peace. I'm the prince of peace. I'm reigning over this. I'm going to give this to you. And here's some peace for you. It's mine to give out. And so we keep the glory of God front and center. And the peace of God comes to us and it follows. And our prayer this Christmas season is that you will experience this shalom. We talked about hope last week. Pastor Ken preached about hope. You can watch that message online. Talking about peace this week. We want you to experience the shalom during this season and beyond. Guarding your heart from bitterness. Guarding your minds from wrong thinking. It's supernatural. It can't be explained. But to Mary and Joseph, this baby was born on this day, the giver of peace, the bringer of shalom, and he wants to give it to you. The peace of God comes to me when God's glory is magnified. Next, let's see what uh, else this peace can change. Third, the peace of God influences my testimony of the works of God. The peace of God influences my testimony of the works of God. Let's see that here in verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who had heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. These common shepherds out in the fields, they're fearful, but then they're changed. And then when the angels depart, they go back up into heaven. They went away. The fear turns to peace, and that peace turns into a response. And the response is, go and find this child and tell what we all heard. They went with haste. There's no waiting. We're going to go. We're going to go right now. We're not going to ask anybody. We just got to get up and go and find this child. So when you get up and go, when you're believing so firmly in something like this, it is because there is a settled assurance, a peace in your heart that what you have heard is true. So they make it to the place where Mary and Joseph are, but before they find them, I mean, they, before they get to see the baby, they got to find them. So they know that it's in Bethlehem, the city of David, and they're in that region, so they head over to Bethlehem, and they get to Bethlehem, and now people start to see shepherds walking through the streets, like, close your doors, right? Be careful, these guys are rough. Who are these rough guys coming up here near us, you know? Be careful, and the shepherds are looking. Uh, it was a manger. Okay, mangers are in stables or caves or where animals are, so uh, let's go and find the manger, so they start to go into stables. I imagine them opening up a door and looking, okay, there's a manger there, there's some animals, but there's no baby. Let's go to another place. Over to this cave here, there's a uh, manger, there's some animals looking around, but there's no baby. And then they finally get to this one, and there's a man, there's a woman, there's a baby in a manger, and they're like, we found it! And so they come up without waiting, and they come over, and they come to this right manger. And there they see the baby lying in the manger. Like, man, the angel said that, but man, even as shepherds, as rough as we are, we know you don't lay your kid in a manger. And so there is this manger, and the manger is the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. And uh, we've had three children, all born in the hospital, and after they were born, we would wrap them in swaddling cloths. This is right after Alicia was born. We placed her in Nathan's uh, hands, and Nathan was holding her. And she started out wrapped, you know, like this, and we passed, him on, passed her on, and she would always do this thing where her arm would just come up, her thumb, right? So there's a, there's a picture, it's like just arm up, you know, like that. And so this shows that they are caring for the child, and so they placed him in this manger. And now the shepherds, they start to talk about what they had experienced. Listen, you're not going to believe this, we were just in the fields, and we were there, you know, the sheep were all around, and uh, we didn't even have time to shower. We just came right over and wanted to tell you what happened. We are in the fields, and this angel showed up, and this angel started speaking. And Mary and Joseph were like, oh, an angel. Yeah, they'd already experienced that. And so they're like, the angel showed up, and the angel said that in the city of David is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and we were going to find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and here we are, and here's the baby. And 
we had fear, but now we have no fear, and we wanted to come and tell you all of these things, just like it happened. In verse 18, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So they wondered. All the people that were there, we know Mary and Joseph were there. We know the shepherds were there. Maybe some of the people who were seeing the shepherds come, they came also. Maybe they, uh, somebody heard a cry from the, uh, the, bar, the barn or stable. We don't know exactly, but there's some other people there. And all who heard it wondered, wondered. In other words, they were amazed. The testimony of these shepherds amazed them. It brought them to a place of wonder. And as we give our testimonies about what God has done, it causes people to wonder. When you share a miracle that's happened, when you share that, like, I was really in trouble and then God saved me and this is what happened, it was a miracle. When you say that somebody was healed, when you say that somebody passed and yet you have this peace in your life and they're like, I don't understand that. When you say those things and share those things, people start to wonder. They start to move towards amazement. And for me, it wasn't the first time I heard the gospel or the second or the third or the tenth or the twentieth. But somewhere along the line, as I heard the gospel, as I heard the testimony of people, I ended up confessing Jesus as Lord. So be faithful in sharing your story of what God has done in your life. You know, we often meet new people and we just start to talk to them about their faith and they share about the time where they're just like, I was so broken and you, know, you can't even believe it because they're so together now and they start to share, I was so broken and I was lost and Jesus came into my life and it changed me and you're just like, yeah, that's so cool, that's what he does. And people, as they hear that, they have amazement so you can give testimony because God empowers it just like he did for them. In verse 19, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole narrative of Jesus' birth. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. I'm going to read that again. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Mary, 14, 15 years old, we don't know. She gets news that she's pregnant. An angel says that you're pregnant. How can I be pregnant? I, I haven't been with a, a man. I, this, this, this can't be true. And you know, The baby that's inside of you is a son of the Most High God, and you're favored, and you're going to bear this child. Imagine what the conversation with her parents would have been like. I'm pregnant, and there was an angel, and, you know, uh, just believe me, you know, Mary, what have you done? What are you doing? And that, those days, it would have been so scandalous. What are you doing to our family and our name, Mary? And then Joseph, who was betrothed to her, when he finds out, he's like, I'll just quietly divorce her, but I can't go through with this because now my name is going to be tied to this. And so he's there, and an angel comes to him. And so then Joseph, you know, it's all my imagination, by the way, part of it. Joseph maybe made it over to Mary's house and as they're talking there, yeah, listen, mom and dad, to be, this is true. The angel came to me as well. And so here's Mary, nine months carrying this child. She knows, because she knows what her history has been with Joseph. She knows that this is a miracle inside of her, growing with every kick, moms, with every kick, wonder, treasuring, pondering, and here's Mary, now finally able to see this child that she'd been waiting to see, laying her eyes on her own Savior. And these shepherds come in and say, this is what we saw. An angel told us. And Mary treasures up all of these things in her heart. And we know about this because she shared it with Luke as an eyewitness, and Luke wrote it down so that we could read it and be encouraged and inspired today. Sometimes our testimony causes people to think and wonder in amazement like those uh, people who were around who wondered. But sometimes our testimony causes a person to have comfort in their life. I really needed to hear that. Thank you. I too have been struggling. Thank you for sharing that with me. This is a 
comfort to me, and it's a confirmation to me that I'm on the right path. So keep on opening up your mouth and giving testimony and sharing because you never know who is listening. It could be somebody who needs to be wondered and amazed, or it could be someone who needs to just hear it so they can ponder it and treasure it up in their hearts like Mary. The peace of God changes us, overcomes my fear, comes to us as God's glory is magnified. It makes my testimony come to life with powerful responses. And finally, notice, the peace of God transforms my ordinary life into extraordinary praise. Verse 20, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. The peace of God transforms my ordinary life into extraordinary praise. After they see what has happened, they get up and they go back to the mundane. They leave the child, and they go back to their fields. They return to where they were. And as they're returning, they are glorifying God. They're praising God. This God has changed them from ordinary, and their lives are now extraordinary praise. They're worshiping God on their way back. One of the joys of our life here at the church is to be able to share the gospel with people who come, and sometimes people want to you know, meet with us and things. And uh, Billy Nelson, he's here in the service right now. His picture's going to come up on the screen. Uh, Billy is one of those guys, and we've talked about him before. You know, he's, uh, we've done a God at Work video about him. But as I was me- preparing this message, I thought of him because of the countenance of Billy Nelson before he came to faith in Christ. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. He's sm- all smiles up here, but the old Billy, when he first came in, he was not smiling. Man, he was like, he was miserable. He just came in. He's like, yeah, I'd like to, I'm not, I don't want to joke about this. Like, it, I know some people really feel this, but he's my friend now, so I could joke with him. He came in, and he was miserable. He's like, man, I, I just uh, I need a lot of change in my life. I don't know what's going on, and uh, I need some help and things, and maybe you guys can help me, and I will think I'll come here and commit here. Like, it was just like that. No affect, just straight like that. No intonation. I mean, he's like a robot, you know, talking. And I was in my old office down here, and you know me, I like to kind of joke a little bit and try to get people to like break the ice and so I'd joke a bit try to break the ice nothing <laughs> like nothing just you know okay what's next so what, what do you think I should do should I get into Bible study should I come to just tell me the facts you know just the facts like so he still comes to church for a while and a couple weeks later months later I don't know he hears messages and he ends up confessing Christ as Lord and just like that the addictions went away he'll, he'll talk about these things himself the addictions went away and the joy of the Lord came upon his face. He, cha- like, he looked different. <laughs> He's married to Jen now, and he would have had no shot with Jen if he was robot guy. <laughs> but Jen now and Billy, they've got the joy of the Lord. Their ordinary lives have been transformed into lives of extraordinary praise. And Billy and Jen had a vision to go to Africa to be missionaries. And so they uh, went there. They lived there uh, for a time. And then they had this vision. They said, you know what? Africans can reach Africa better than we can reach Africa. And so they started an organization. They don't take any money from it themselves. They're just raising money to try to plant churches in Africa and unreached people groups. Their lives are become extraordinary praise. They've got missionaries that are out there working. And they also are helping all of it, glorifying God, extraordinary praise. It's like those shepherds turning around and walking with a bounce in their step. And this is what God does. He changes us. It's a transformation. The shepherds experienced it. And I believe by faith that some of you who are holding out can experience it too if you would bend your knee and confess Christ as Lord. And so maybe that will be your step this Christmas season to give praise to Jesus Christ for the first time who you've celebrated with presents and all these other things. But this year, maybe it'll be different that the peace of Christ would rule in your hearts. Father, we are so thankful for your son Jesus, the Prince of Peace, and thank you for the word of God that we could read and study and reflect on this whole service about shalom, about peace, and we want to be people of peace. And So turn our fear into peace, turn our worry into peace, give us, O Prince of Peace, more of that. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.